Well, I'm uh, good to see you guys here today. I'm going to do a little presentation on the uh, Core Web Vitals update for Google Search. And what, what this is, there's been a lot of confusion around it. And it's been actually something that's uh, very and very critical and of a good money maker for me. So I wanted to share kind of the, the importance of it and the importance for businesses. Um, so what, what it basically means is Google is, is starting to promote quality web development uh, more in search, meaning if you're, and this, and this first step towards that is core web vitals is what they call. And core web vitals is a search, search ranking factor that is based off of your website speed and how, and, the, and really the real user performance that users have with it. So uh, my name is Sam Carlton. I'm a web consultant here in Tulsa. Um, and I'm gonna go through this today. And if you hear something that resonates with you or that you're excited about, or you wanna share with the rest, rest of the group or people who might watch later on, uh, you can drop a uh, comment or a quote with some, in honor of, of GME and stonks with some rocket or diamond hands emojis. Uh, into the user, into the Slack group in Techlahoma, and it's just the UG dash Tulsa Web Devs channel in, in the Techlahoma, and uh, or in the Techlahoma Slack rather. And feel free to drop any anything that you like in there. So we're going to get into the talk. So, what is Core Web Vitals? Well, it it is a new ranking signal inside of Google that decides the order of search, search results in a specific scenario. Now it doesn't it's not the, the only ranking factor. It's actually only one of 200 that Google uses, but it's the, the first step that Google wants to make in order to open up how it, it ranks websites and make that info available for, for anybody who builds websites and runs websites to be able to improve their site based on the, the metric that Google gives out, as opposed to it being a, kind of this secretive thing that only, you know, that's closed box. Uh, so that what this means is any performance work you have or will do on your web projects can have a more important role and will be valued by organizations that typically wouldn't consider speed or page speed a priority. So you might say like, well, you know, you've talked to your boss about like, well, we need to, you know, our website is super slow. It doesn't work. You know, it takes like 30 seconds to load up on a phone and they're like, okay, well, how to, and your boss is like, well, or your client is, well, how does that, how does that help me with all my money problems? And so what is the, what, this is a direct answer to that because Google search for a lot of businesses and a lot of organizations has a direct correlation with traffic and money. And it's, it's very easy to connect. And what that does is it creates a much more easy scenario to be able to share, you know, get, get validation and to put effort into do, doing this performance work. Um, you should be building, building sites that serve quickly for users. This is just one more justification for that. So who is this kind of important for? Uh, the first people is small websites that want to grow. So small businesses, um, mom and pop shops, they, they, there are a few very simple and easy steps to implement these performance improvements that will affect not just uh, user experience for Google, but also user experience across the board. The reason they're doing this is because websites that load faster are gen generally more a pleasant user experience for everybody for uh, in general. And they don't just want fast websites to rank, they want people to have a good experience when they're using Google. So if two websites are equally relevant to a search term, then they want the faster one to show up or the one that's more secure or the one that, you know, that has a better uh, accessibility factors. So the second people that this is kind of important for is web developers that care about the best website experience, um, which is, I assume, every web developer uh, and creating that just, just a healthy experience and a representation of your organization or your client's organizations if you're a consultant. So who is this very important for? Organizations that heavily depend on traffic from already competitive search results. One example of this is e-commerce. 
um, I've gotten a few clients, e-commerce clients already that they, they are very serious about ranking. They're, they're already in competitive, like highly competitive search rankings that are important that literally directly correlate to how much money they make. And so it's not hard to justify the expense for them to spend on me or within their organization to spend on their own, own web developers time to make these performance improvements. Uh, the second is organizations that need every advantage for search. Now that may not correlate directly to money like it would with e-commerce, but if you're an, an organization that you have a lot of content and, and you, you depend on that content to, to, for some very important reason, uh, that can, you know, this will also affect you. Uh, and then the third is developers that want to get compensated for learning performance skills. Again, this, this goes back to either consultants or freelancers or developers who are already in an organization and they just, they just wanted a, a kind of a reason to ask for a raise and say like, Hey, if we hit this performance metric of this site page speed, we, you know, can we agree to, you know, maybe a pay bump or some, some kind of bonus, uh, because it'll, and you can, then you can directly measure how that improves your organization and why that justifies a pay bump or some kind of monetary compensation. And the other, the fourth one is perfectionist. This is me. Um, I love to see those. Yeah. Yeah. James too. I love to see those perfect scores. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to give a disclaimer. The point of this is not for you to always get perfect scores. Um, even Google will say that uh, their tools will can have perfect 100 scores, but that doesn't, it's, it's, there's not any meaningful, if you're already in the green reason for it, it's just, if you're a perfectionist and you want to get it absolutely perfect. Um, it's kind of a binary, the way Google is set up, it's a binary condition of if you pass core web vitals and the three metrics they measure, then you get a better ranking. If you don't, then you get a ranking below anybody who does pass core web vitals. Um, so who shouldn't care about this? Developers that are running non-public facing websites, but you should still, it, your site should still be fast for good user experience. Meaning if you have a, if you have an area of your site, that's a login system that wouldn't be picked up by Google, that wouldn't be picked up, then Core Web Vitals is super important for you. You can still use it as a metric to measure your progress. So you can actually go into Google Chrome. And if you have a site that's behind a login and you can't plug in a public facing link to test it, you could actually test it within Chrome within the Lighthouse tool. And the other one is dogs. Um, dogs don't, you know, dogs don't care about that. So, so go move on to the next thing. So here are some misconceptions about uh, Google ranking fast sites. So some people have asked like, if my site is the fastest out of all the sites that get ranked, will my site site show up first? No, I, your site is will only be ranked relative to, uh, well, relative to its relevance. So for example, if you search Google and you build a site that's faster than Google and has all the same words as Google, you're, you're not going to get ranked higher than Google. That wouldn't make sense. And that would, that would be a, a major problem. Uh, it's not the, it's also not the most important factor that Google considers when ranking a website. It, it's again, it's more of a competitive one. So it's when you're, you're in a particular niche, uh, maybe it's a keyword or just in general, you want to, you want some kind of extra advantage. Um, then it's, then it's an extra factor that, that pushes you a little bit further than you were before. Um, whether you pass core web vitals will be based on the performance of your site with real humans using it. So the, the, when you use these tools that I'll, I'll show later on, or I'll, I'll give you links to later on, when you use these tools, uh, you'll get scores, but those are simulated scores. So the actual, the actual metrics Google measures to decide whether you pass core web vitals are not based on those scores that are, that are run with code, but are based on the actual performance it records with real users using your site. So that way, if there's some kind of some kind of metric that's off, you won't get you won't get hit. And the the user the real real life scores tend to be a little a little bit more generous than the simulated ones. So you you know you get a little bit of grace there. Uh, so, you, you, however, checking your core web vitals 
and page speed insights will give you a simulated score to help you get an idea of where you stand. So you still, you know, if you don't have real users yet, or you don't have that 20 day, 28 day rolling average, you can still get a general idea of where you stand with the simulated metrics. Um, so larger sites are, are going to have a harder time hitting the performance targets uh, past 80. But you don't you don't necessarily have to go past 80. Anything past 50 or 60 is pretty good. In the 70s, you're you're doing great. And past 80, it's it's just all excellence. Um, so what but what that also means is that smaller sites that have less content or that have less technical debt that can move faster are also going to give it get an advantage to be able to shift up temporarily ahead of the larger sites that they're, they're, you know, they're big moving ships. They have, if they're, if they're making a change, of, even if it's a performance improvement to every page, it's going to take a lot of QA and testing and maybe AB testing and deploying parts of the site. You know, I'm thinking of Amazon in my head, uh, and, but it's going to take them a while to, to make that turn, to make that shift for it to work out. Uh, so the other thing is, so sites aren't measured, sites are measured on the, on usually at first sites are going to be measured on the average of all pages. So you're going to get one score for your whole site, uh, not individually. So you may, when you run the tests, you may, it may report different scores for each page, but it's going to be the average of all, you, all of your pages. And then, uh, or maybe not the average, maybe, maybe some kind of other average like metric that Google uses based on your most popular pages, something like that. That's going to be an area that is kind of a black box that isn't closed off that they're not going to uh, necessarily share. Um, but uh, sometimes there are, there is an exception to that overall score. If your site is very large, then Google will start to break up your pages into groupings. So it might have a group where this is the Core Web Vitals performance for posts. This is a Core Web Vitals performance for product pages. This is the core of the vitals performance for listings like home listings or something like that. Uh, and then field data that is recorded from your users is used more than test data you get for running page sites once again. Uh, and then the average, I talked about earlier about the 28 days, the, the field data is going to be the average scoring of the last 28 day rolling period. So when you make an improvement, it'll show up instantly in the testing tools but it'll it or it'll take to, up to 28 days to show that performance. If there was a performance improvement, it'll take 28 days to show that performance improvement in in uh, the field data, which is the real user testing. You can also like when you run your scores and page speed insights, it will show you that field data. So where you stand. So you may so after you make an improvement, page speed insights may show that the in the the simulated score you pass core web vitals but you don't pass core web vitals in the field data yet because it hasn't it hasn't you know, the updates haven't been rolling and used enough yet so on to the next thing uh, so how do i check core web vitals so you might you may have been wondering like this page speed insights what the, what is this thing you keep talking about well there's a, core web vitals is a part of a metric that google uses called page experience which is what they describe as uh, users like the quality of a user's experience on your website or on your web page. Um, that will be, and it'll be used a, 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 as one of the 200 ranking signals, all of which aren't public, uh, that Google already uses to score your site. And you can check how Google reports your site's core web files using the PageSpeed Insights tool. Uh, and there's also a few other resources. So. Uh, Lighthouse is Lighthouse. It, Lighthouse is page, page piece insights have a little bit of overlap, but they're also different tools. So some people will confuse them and conflate them. Um, but basically, what it is is the core the core tool. Lighthouse is a is a developer tool that Google deploys a, across multiple products. One of those is is if you go to the https colon slash slash web dot dev. Uh, there's a measure tool on there that will give that will just let you tr uh, try out a lighthouse score online and lighthouse is is a set of four scores that uh, 
your site gets based on, and one of them is performance, which is where PageSpeed Insights score comes from. Um, and then the other, the other three are, I believe, accessibility, uh, best practices, which is things like using HTTPS, just like the, the common things that you'd be like, oh, well, of course I would do that. Or the uncommon things that you might not know about, like using alt tags on images. Uh, and then the fourth one is, uh, oh, I can't remember it at the moment. What is it? I think I have it on here. SEO. So and this is Google's definition of SEO. And it's basically the best practices for SEO performance, which they don't actually, it's actually SEO is the easiest one to max out because they don't have a high bar for what is good SEO. They have a high bar for what is good performance, which tells you what they care about as opposed to these SEO experts telling you like, oh, you need to focus on like this new trend. Um, th these are the things that Google actually wants you to care about. So uh, the second tool is PageSpeed Insights, which I've already talked about, and it measures your site speed metrics, just one score uh, for, it gives you one score, one score for the, the page performance. And then it also breaks down how it measures that score. So the, the main score is a zero to 100. And then it also breaks down the timings, which which is what that main score is based off of. One, one example is time to first byte. Uh, so it's, that's how long it takes to for the device to receive the first byte from your site. So that involves the, the time your, your server takes to generate the response and send it. And then the time it takes the DNS to, to connect uh, all those kinds of things. And then it also measures after that. Um, one of them is, uh, I, think, I think it's like, they have, they have like a, a several dozen of them. And then they have six, six, I believe that they feature prominently that are the most important. And three of those six are the core, core web vitals that you need to pass. Um, so go to the next field. So here are, hopefully everybody can see that all right. Here are three performance scores from real websites. Uh, the first is reddit.com and it gets a performance score of 36. Uh, the second is Microsoft. And these are out of a hundred, by the way. The second is Microsoft. Uh, the third is Amazon. So this gives you, this is this is the other thing. People people get so obsessed about getting the perfect 100 performance score, but not even Amazon gets that. And how much money do you think Amazon is already spending on performance? Not only does, when Amazon saves a dollar on performance, not only does it give them a ranking improvement, but it also, like for every, uh, you could, there's probably some metric, I haven't looked this up, but you could say for every, one kilobyte Amazon saves on their pay, home page load time or load load size, it's a hundred thousand dollars easily. Like you could, you could, you know, they, some of these sites, they, it, those that's performance is actually really important to them. They're just such a big moving ship. It takes a long time for them to, to make any kind of progress on it. Um, so, so just to set the expectation, if you don't, you know, if you run your site through here and it's a, and, it, and you get like a 62, it's okay. Amazon gets a 63. You're you're on the level with Amazon. Um, that's you know the purpose of these scores is to kind of set a high bar that you then strive for. Um, but again, even Amazon doesn't pass it. So uh, moving on to the next set of scores. So this is Wikipedia, which is 99. Netflix, which is 69. And then a small, this is a small company in Mountain View, California called google.com. And they have a 58 uh, performance score. You may have heard of them uh, in the, you know, in the tech news or something. So what the, what these scores mean, the interesting thing about Wikipedia, if you'll go to the Wikipedia homepage, the one with all the links in, in the circle, you'll notice that it's actually mostly HTML and very simple elements and very, and it's very static in nature. There's not a lot of complicated CSS loading. There may, no, there may be no JavaScript at all. There may be a little bit for analytics, but I, again, I'm not sure. But one of the, thing, one of the uh, interesting uh, things that's coming out of this is that static sites such as Hugo and Jekyll perform exceptionally well on these scores. And it actually pays to not use JavaScript on the client side whenever you don't need it. So what's happening is like all, some of these older legacy code bases that use jQuery, use some of these sites that, but they, they don't really need to use these libraries. They're gonna start suffering and they're ranking, they're gonna start getting outranked when it comes to core web vitals by these sites that 
are only using what they need to or are not using any javascript or are just as as plain html as you can get the interesting thing is that we've almost come full, full circle where the sites that are almost like sites that you could have built in the 90s are now going to perform the best in in this performance rating ranking um and then we have netflix.com netflix they don't you know they're they're not they're not super interested in seo uh, i imagine they're you know they're already going to rank for what they want to rank for um and they you know they have a more closed system as far as their user base goes and then google google will i imagine the more they get called out on this they'll improve it over time but it's interesting to see like not even google performs very well at this score the the other interesting thing is not hardly any of google sites get actually get a perfect perfect score uh, most of them will get 50 some of them would get far worse i think youtube had like a 30 or a 40 when i measured it um so not even google websites or services score well on this metric but they're still going to use it and the interesting part is there are other google products such as google analytics and especially YouTube embeds, that if you do embed a YouTube video directly on your site, it drops your score pretty dramatically because it's so unoptimized. Now it's it's optimized for people to be able to watch a video, but it's not yet optimized per, for performance. So what you have to do is you have to use, implement uh, more modern web, web techniques such as lazy loading or uh, progressive enhancement to be able to not have to load those, you know, those elements in until you need them effectively uh going on to the next part uh so for so how implementing this for new sites um so again going back to uh websites optimized through speed by building on a modern web development tools are going to be the best option um or just plain html websites again that you would host on amazon s3 and just deploy a static html there's no server there's no php there's no, it's just static HTML. So Jamstack and static sites are uniquely equipped to deliver some of the that best and fastest performance for core web vitals. And the tricky part is it isn't always possible, you know, especially if you're already working a company, that means they already have a website. And so it all isn't always possible to start from scratch, um, but there are some extra options you can use that we'll talk to talk about in a bit. So if you are starting from scratch, some excellent options are uh, Next.js, which is a, a React-based framework, which meaning it's JavaScript. And it is, and it's JavaScript on the, on the client and the server side. So you're writing one programming language for both client and server, which means it's node-based when you're, when you're writing the server code. But also Next.js have, has a static rendered mode. So it can render the entire stack, uh, site statically, and then you can host it on a resource like Amazon S3. Um, and uh, the other part is Next.js is actually very mature and there's a lot of very popular sites already using it. That's why I put it at the top. And these are sorted from the most mature to the least mature, but they're all still great. Uh, the second one is Hugo and I, and I should have put Jekyll in here, um, but Hugo is a framework agnostic, meaning you don't need Reactor View to, to, to be able to use it. It's, not, it's just more leaning towards plain HTML layouts and it's written in Go, so it's extremely fast when you're rendering pages. That's another concern. If you have, I mean, if you have fifty thousand endpoints that you have to render, some of these heavier JavaScript-based rendering static rendering tools aren't going to be ideal for that. But there actually are tools that are much better like that, such as Hugo or Jack, Jekyll. Um, the the third one I have is Gatsby. Uh, Gatsby is a static-first React React-based uh, framework for static sites as opposed to Next.js, which is a node first, which is a server side first. Uh, the, the fourth one is Nuxt, which is actually a spin on Next.js. That's for Vue view, view frameworks. I mean, and since Vue is a, uh, has a much lower barrier to entry and as much, in my opinion, and I don't mean to get political, but it's, uh, it, can be a, it can lead to a little bit more cleaner code management than React, because React gives you a little bit more freedom. Um, uh, but it's you know it's it's most of, mostly about whatever tool is the best for you, uh, and then the final one is Eleven D. This one is my personal favorite because it's framework agnostic, but it is based in Node. So you generate your entire site uh, in a stat in a on a server, and then that server uploads those files to a static directory, and then you can deploy those. 
and it's it's extremely fast. I was I picked this one specifically because I have a project where I'm where I have to, where I'm, my target is to generate fifty thousand endpoints in five minutes statically, and that was the one that got me that result. I believe Hugo will also get a similar result, but I wasn't as comfortable with Go. So it you know it, there's a, there's a good number of options to check out what you what you want. Um, so if you want to check out some actual real life statically generated sites, uh, Homebrew is a good one. I believe Homebrew is written in Hugo. Uh, so the Homebrew formulae site and Homebrew is just a, if you don't already know, it's a software management tool for uh, libraries. And also they have casks, which are full Mac apps. It's, a, it's Mac only, for, but it's basically a, a dependency management for your, for your Mac computer. Um, so you can install things like Node and other script, scripts and tools that you would use in development. Uh, the next one is Sketch. Sketch is a, is a design and user experience tool for, for building apps and websites or designing apps and websites. Um, and uh, they, their site, again, is entirely static, no servers used. And the, the next one is Marvel.com. You may have heard of Marvel. They have some, they've made a few movies recently. Um, and their site is actually built with Next.js. So what's what's funny is these these tools aren't just kind of, sometimes we, what you get with more modern JavaScript tools is you have these scripts that are that are cool and fun to use, but they haven't been battle tested. Next.js is a framework that has been battle tested and is used by big brands. Um, another one that uses Next.js is Twitch Mobile. So if you're on Twitch on your phone, not on, in the app, then you're, you're, the site you're looking at is generated with Next.js. So again, it's it's a very battle tested framework. And I would if you're if you're looking for something, if you have to use a tool that is, that has been proven then Next.js is gonna be the, the best one to go to. Uh, the final one is a site I built called Does It Arm? And that's all built with, it's actually a combination of Nuxt for the first layer of static generation. And then I come in and then it comes in and generates additional pages with 11 so it can go beyond because Nuxt has limitations of performance when you're generating more than a thousand endpoints. Um, so for existing sites, uh, here, your, some of your options are improving existing pages based on the PageSpeed Insights and Lighthouse recommendations. So you can actually get some decent gains just with simple fixes like lazy loading images or using um, uh, a trick you want to implement is using more modern uh, web image formats. Images are going to be when you're starting from scratch on performance. Images are going to be the biggest, the easiest, and biggest performance gain you're going to find anywhere. Uh, because they're they're usually the number one reason the site site is slow. So uh, using more modern web formats such as WebP or the new I think it's AVIF is a is a brand new format that is supported on everything but um, it's supported on I believe it's going to be supported on iPhones in a few generations. But you can also there you can also use source tags so the device will pick the right file based on what it can support. Um, so the next one is to use a caching solution such as Cloudflare DNS. I like Cloudflare DNS uh, because it's it's kind of like set it and forget it. Uh, they're they're very generous with their free tiers, and uh, it's it caches your entire site. So you can actually take uh, server server side applications and set it up behind Cloudflare DNS, and it'll it'll give you some automatic caching. Um, it's still not quite as bad, good as a uh, statically generated site entirely, but it's a good middle solution for you to get there. There's also other DNS providers that have caching options as well. Uh, and the last one is to use static based tools to rebuild only, instead of rebuilding your whole site, you, you rebuild only a specific group of pages uh, that are public in one example, it could, could, you, could just be public facing pages. One example could be just blog posts where you, or one example could be subdomains. So let's say you have a blog that's hosted on one, one of your subdomains, then you, you redeploy that in a new framework just to try it out. And that's going to get a huge SEO or it's huge performance bump, most importantly. And then it'll get the, the SEO bump later on. And another thing to note is like, this isn't just something that Google is interested in. Um, other search engines such as DuckDuckGo and Bing will also be interested in serving these sites uh, to do, that have better performance. Um, so another thing is uh, a really common thing for existing sites is WordPress. 
Um, and I have worked with WordPress and there are methods you can use to help, help, help you gain advantage for WordPress performance. It is, it is very much more of an uphill battle, um, but one option is to use WordPress's built-in REST API. And what that does is it takes your existing content and, it and you can pull that into a static site builder and generate pages based off of that REST content. So you don't actually have to have your content managers or the people who use the login systems to, to actually go in and rebuild something for them. They can use their existing system and then you could build a, a static site on top of that. And naturally this is gonna to apply to other content management systems such as Drupal, such even older stuff, they're gonna have extensions and frameworks. If they don't already have REST APIs built in, they're gonna have extensions and frameworks that generate that. And, and basically what all it is, is it, it's just a JSON uh, endpoint with the, pub, the data that was already available publicly. Uh, but you'll have to, you know, you'll have to be careful because it is, it does have access to the database. So, you know, if you do store content that you don't want to be public from your CMS, you'll have to make sure it's not, it's only, only showing the things that you want it to show. Uh, so here are a few resources you can check out. Um, if you click on the link in, uh, I posted it in Slack, you can click on these directly, or you can just go to the website at the bottom, uh, sam.lc slash faster, and it'll give you the, the full document for the resources for this talk. Um, and that's it. Looks like I have four seconds to spare, Diana. Hopefully I don't, uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I had a good mark on my 30 minutes. Uh, but yeah, now, now we're gonna, I'm gonna open it up for questions uh, that you guys may have. Uh, feel free to unmute and jump in. Um, whatever you're that ready. really informative. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yeah, we do have some questions from Ryan in the chat that he doesn't have a microphone or uh, camera tonight. Okay, what, do, what is Ryan's question? Let's see here. Um, the first one is, does that require smart cars with Zigbee or something? I'm not sure There's what this is related to. Um, is oh, that smart. oh, I think that was for Bill's thing that he was talking about earlier. Oh, yes. Okay, let me jump down then. Um, he's got some other questions. I see that now. Thank you. Uh, how about SSR websites with little JS? Yes, SSR websites are going to be great. Um, you're not going to get as much advantage as you would with a full static website. Uh, but you can kind of compensate, and I, sh I should say as much advantage. Static sites are just the the simplest, uh, easiest win as far as performance. It's just hard to beat them. But just because your site's not static doesn't mean it's bad. Um, and some sites they cannot be static, uh, especially you know when you have server communication that that is required. The the interesting thing is that most sites don't require a server. They, they don't require, you know, in the, in the more modern serverless meaning, um, they don't require like a PHP renderer to generate the content. If it's a, if it's a knowledge-based article that only gets updated every 18 months, then you can serve it statically um, and it's going to be great. But if you're stuck to server-side rendered, then you can, you can, again, you can implement something like I talked about like the Cloudflare cache or a server-side cache as well. So the benefit of a Cloudflare cache or a DNS cache is that it's going to, instead of the device going from, from the satellite, you know, up into space to, you know, whatever DNS connections and then to the server, you can cache it on the server, but it's still that cached request that, that is, it is technically static. It still has to go back up into space and do all this stuff and then go back down to the device. If you cache it with a DNS provider like Cloudflare, um, I know there are some alternatives, but it, it, Cloudflare is just the easiest one to set up. I'm, I'm trying not to plug them too much, but it'll cache it wi within the DNS. So you're actually, there is no connecting to your server if this resource is already cached. So it's actually even faster. Um, and if you do edge caching, it, it might it might even serve the the resource, the whether it's a website or an image, uh, from a local area. So you might connect to Facebook, which is you know it might be hosted in San Francisco, 
But if they have their edge caching set up, then you're going to get a version of the Facebook site, a static copy that is served maybe from a data center, you know, in the Midwest. So there is there is that performance advantage. That's now that and that's getting a little bit into like splitting hairs. If you're if you're generating a server side rendered application with Node, you're probably already pretty well off. Um, the the trickier ones are going to be the older ones that were built before uh, before phones and before uh, modern like expectations for, for performance were a thing, and that's that's going to there's, that's going to come into probably it's going to be a better fit, benefit to worry about image things like images um, and CSS uh, cleaning purging if you will like removing the CSS that you don't use on pages is going to be a the bigger win than going from server side rendered to static. He says um, this would be SSR with Go. I don't. I, I imagine there's SSR with Go. I mean, Go is a Go is not a device language, uh, so, and it's I from what I understand, it's very fast. So I imagine you could. I don't see why there wouldn't be. I don't think Hugo. I don't think is server side rendered. Maybe there's a version that is, but I would be very surprised if there was not a web framework that allows server side rendering, non-static server side rendering, with Go. There is okay. Okay. cool. He says there is that he uses it. Yeah, feel free to plug that and and uh, maybe I can get that added to the documents as well. Hugo is okay. just a good language. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so so Hugo is what is probably what what. Yeah, again, I don't know a ton about Hugo. I'm more of a JavaScript and Node guy, uh, so I have to apologize for my uh, lack of knowledge on that. But I imagine I guess Hugo is connects to the server-side rendering part. Yeah. And then he had another question. What competitors are out there, preferably self-hosted FOSS stuff uh, to keep from feeding data to Google? So competitors for static rendering, um, Vue is a, or sorry, you said for hosting, self-hosted. So self-hosted is trickier. I, I'm, I'm curious what you, like how self-hosted you're thinking. Are you thinking like not even using Amazon? Competitors for for SpageB. Oh, oh, okay, I got, it. I got you. Yeah, so there are there are other performance measuring tools that measure the that measure kind of in a more generous way. One is uh, Pingdom Tools, Pingdom PageSpeed Insights. Another one is um, uh, it was what was it? I can't remember the name right now. Maybe I can post it later. But the, the tricky part is some of these performance tools are now using Lighthouse, but Lighthouse, one thing to note is Lighthouse is just a, a tool, um, is a piece of software. It doesn't, it doesn't have it built in where it reports to Google. The, the advantage you would lose, you could say, you could, if you were to say like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to make Google the main thing. You know, I want to make sure there's competition. Um, that would be the argument against using a lighthouse based tool. Um, so there, yeah, there are other performance tools. I think GT metrics does use lighthouse. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of that other one, but there are other web tools that you can base off of. And honestly, they're going to give you great results. You just won't be able to see exactly how Google sees those results. And so if your goal is to it's to, I mean, it, Google's the game in town. Like the DuckDuckGo is growing and there's been a rumor like maybe they'll get bought by Apple. And if they do, they'll grow even more. Um, but right now Google is the game. And if you if you check off all the boxes on PageSpeed, you're gonna, you're gonna be checking off other boxes too. Uh, but I would say if you're, if you're really, if you really have a conviction about it, just go with, um, what was it? What was the one I said? Pingdom Tools. Pingdom Tools is a great resource. What other questions do we have? Do we get a question in the Slack? I guess I didn't plug ask any mm -hmm. questions in the Slack. It doesn't look like there's anything in the Slack. Do we have questions okay. in the call? I'm 
maintain that silence that we're good and everybody understands everything. Okay, well, I'll switch. I'll shift over to the last part. Um, if you do have an extra question that you think of later, you feel free to reach out um, to tweet me at that guy Sam on Twitter. Uh, and you can find all the resources for this talk and uh, ask me questions at that link below sam.lc slash faster. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe you'll, you'll, I'll learn something new that I can put in the next talk that Hugo is a templating language, something like that. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sam.